thank you to everybody just joining us for this final session in the data science stream. Uh, we are uh, into another hour, uh, and that's going to start with a presentation of 40, 45 minutes, and again, we'll leave 10 or 15 minutes for question time at the end. Uh, and just for those who've just come in, wave a hand if you'd like to answer a question, we'll get a microphone to you. And again, once again, to those joining us in the virtual stream, you are very welcome to engage as well using the Q&A function. Katleka, over to you to introduce our guest. Yeah, thanks, Piper. We are continuing our hot streak of very interesting and highly engaging conversations in this venue. And we are going into one which is going to be an application of deep reinforcement learning in asset liability management. And you know, the context of this discussion is really around the fact that asset liability management is an essential risk management technique in quantitative finance and actuarial science. It aims to maximize a risk taker's ability for, to fulfill future liabilities. ALM is especially critical in environments of elevated interest rate changes, as was experienced globally between 2021 and 2023. But in particular, um, our speaker has an interest in addressing how we look at ALMs with the appreciation that judgment calls are involved, you know, by actuaries, by quantitative finance specialists, and that he feels and argues, you know, can introduce restrictions and limitations due to human irrationality or automation. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I'm going to welcome on stage Takura Wakwete. Welcome everyone. Thanks for the amazing introduction. It's a pleasure to have you all today in this discussion. So asset liability management is core to actuarial practice. As actuaries, our expertise in managing both assets and liabilities uniquely distinguishes us from other professionals. Therefore, I'm super excited today to introduce this revolutionary framework to add to our toolkit for asset liability management. This AI framework is called Deep Reinforcement Learning, and its power, as we will see, to improve this space is exponential. Our journey today will begin with a brief history of ALM. We'll move over to the current traditional ways of doing ALM and their limitations. The meat of our discussion will be on the Deep Reinforcement Learning technique its benefits, also how to implement it, and the building blocks of that machine learning approach. We'll look at some key results and analyze how they compare to the traditional way of doing things, and we'll end with some concluding thoughts. So this work we're gonna summarize today is available on the convention program, and there's also a full paper that's been recently accepted in the international journal called Intelligent Systems with Applications, so it will live there forever as well. It is worth reminding ourselves of the ultimate objectives of ALM, which is to come up with an optimal asset allocation strategy such that we minimize the likelihood of failing to meet liabilities. Oftentimes, we also have other secondary objectives in addition to this. And we need to simultaneously optimize for those as well. Of course, ALM is critical in all fields of actuarial science and quantitative finance, especially when risks, liabilities, and market conditions are uncertain, such as the times we're living in right now. Now that we've touched on the ultimate objectives, let's quickly run through the origins of ALM. On that, by show of hands, who has an, any idea of who this is? I see three hands, <laughs> which is super, super impressive. Ladies and gentlemen, this man was critical to the formation of our profession. Despite his pristine look there in his pinstripe suit, he wasn't some high-powered celebrity or politician. He was an actuary. To me, ladies and gentlemen, he was Isaac Newton of our profession. His name is Frank Reddington. And 
in the UK, he was so revered that they voted him the greatest actuary of all time. In his paper in 1952, he laid the initial foundations for an ALM solution for interest rate hedging. And he was also a stellar professional. He said that the actuary who's only an actuary is not an actuary. He wanted actuaries to work closely together with other professionals in order not only to make an impact in broader society, but also to learn from their techniques and borrow them and bring them to build our own profession. I resonate with this philosophy. This was my motivation for dedicating the past two years of my life, actually, to diving into the intimidating world of computer science to actually learn how we can borrow some of their techniques to build and bring something new to our community. Back to Frank Reddington. As we all know, his theory put forward that there are three conditions that we need to meet in order to hedge our liability portfolio from interest rate movements. The first one is that the present value of assets must equal to the present value of liabilities. The second one is that the sensitivity of assets to interest rates must be equal to the sensitivity of liabilities to interest rates. In other words, the duration of the assets must meet the duration of the liabilities. This is the most important condition. The third condition is that the convexity of assets must be greater than the convexity of liabilities. This theory has been the bedrock of ALM for the past half century. It served us well. However, as we all know, it's got several shortcomings. The first of which has to do with its assumptions. It assumes that interest rates are flat through time and that when they move, they move in parallel, which is really the case in reality, right? It, only only, it also only works for small changes in interest rates, consequently requiring frequent rebalancing and recalculation. The theory is also unfortunately silent on what to do when there is uncertainty in cash flows and timing of asset and liability cash flows. It's also silent on how we handle situations when certain assets in the market that we require are not available. Another big crutch of this theory is that it doesn't provide a native way for us to optimize for multiple objectives, which is often the reality in practice. This deep, re deep reinforcement learning technique that we're introducing will directly address these issues. In addition to these theoretical limitations, there are often also practical application limitations in how we implement ALM. Without going into too much detail, we have an example of some steps that one might expect to see in reality when implementing ALM in practice. These numerous steps reflect the need for considerations for liabilities, for assets, and also for sourcing data from different stakeholders, different systems, and consolidating it. The process is often too manual, too resource intensive, and too time consuming. We can all relate to situations where we have to sift through vast arrays of data from different systems, having to clean it up before we even start our work. This deep reinforcement learning solution will directly address these issues. The mentioned limitations due to assumptions require us as, as actuaries to actually adjust for the differences between the theory and the reality. We often have to intervene and make some judgments, you know, before we implement ALM. We also mentioned that we often have secondary objectives and within this framework, we don't have a clear way to in incorporate for them. So we also have to adjust for them. So it, it introduces a severe dependency on human input. And you may ask, what's the big deal with that? Aren't we trained professionals after all? Yes, we are. We are indeed well-trained. However, we are still human. Therefore, we are still fallible. We can make honest mistakes. It's common. Also, we are irrational, right? We are inconsistent, and we are often over too confident. We can all think of a few colleagues in our careers who are overconfident, and often they're not always right, right? It's an issue. And 
as human beings, we have biases. We have confirmation biases. When there's complexities, we tend to see what aligns with our beliefs already. We also have what's called availability bias, where we tend to put a higher weight towards the most recent information. We are also subject to emotions. When the markets are turning, when the portfolios are underperforming or overperforming, we can be greedy, we can be fearful. All of that affects how we optimally make decisions. Another critical point is that because of this severe human dependency, in organizations where there's poor governments, sorry, poor governance in general, or poor management in general, ALM also tends to suffer. Think of conflicts of interests, perverse incentives, and so forth. The proposed deep reinforcement learning solution would directly address some of these human limitations. Let's have a look at some practical real life examples which illustrate the permeating instances of these ALM failures and their real life consequences. From a global perspective, let's start over there in the US where they've been hit by the regional banking crisis which has resulted in failure of multiple banks, the most notable being Silicon Valley Bank. There's also been failures in other banks as well, within the mid-sized range of the segment. The source of this has been an inability to withstand the rapid rise in interest rates that we've seen, over 500 basis points of, of increases over the past few years. In the UK, they were also hit by the liability-driven investment crisis, or LDA crisis, end of last year. This crisis was so acute that it put a death nail in the new government at the time, represented there by their former prime minister and chancellor of the Exchequer, Lee Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. The long and short of it is that their new budget plan was negatively received and it triggered a bond sell-off. That wasn't the main issue. Where poor ALM contributed the problem is that it exacerbated the problem when most of their pension funds were caught off guard running leveraged LDI strategies. They suddenly required liquidity and had to sell off further the underlying bonds there, which triggered a dead spiral in the UK bond market. This caused chaos in the UK economy because mortgages, bonds, and other loans, for example, are indexed to the bond market. So it caused a spike in interest rates across the entire economy, which led to a severe loss in confidence in the government. It was so bad that the central bank had to actually guarantee buying bonds at the time where they were trying to increase interest rates. This shows how systemic these issues can be and how slow our so-called sophisticated ways can be when, when times are extreme. Closer to home, we have a fair share of our own examples. Within banking, we have had a few failures recently, most notable being VBS, which was so devastating for the poor, poorest members of our community. We've also had a few other examples in the past. Within traditional insurance, we have seen recent issues within companies such as Constantia Insurance even within the healthcare space, there's been failure of health squared medical scheme. We can see that the impacts to people is real. In most of these instances, this is literally life or death situations. Victims are left holding the bag with written off cars and so forth. So up to now, we have seen the traditional way of doing things. We've looked at real life examples. And ladies and gentlemen, if we continue to rely on these traditional ways of doing ALM in a world which is changing and constantly having these new technologies, we're going to constantly see and continually see these, these issues. We need to breathe new life into this space. The answer lies in AI, specifically in deep reinforcement learning. Before we deep dive into how to implement this, let's look at some examples where huge leaps have been made using this deep reinforcement learning technique. The first is self-driving cars. Deep reinforcement learning has enabled cars to either fully or semi 
um, autonomously drive themselves. A big leader in this space is Tesla. However, even with our cars today, we have so many features that semi-automatically drive our cars. We have driver assistant packages such as lane keeping assist with our cars today that's been demonstrated to save lives significantly. That's one example. The second one is within gaming. Computers these days are far better at playing games than humans. In the past, when computers initially beat humans, for example here, that's Gary Kasparov, former number one chess player, it used brute force. However, there were still games which had so many possibilities, such as gore, and require intuition, and computers weren't able to beat humans. Up until recently, when reinforcement learning was introduced into this space. In the picture there, that's the number one Go chess player, Lee Sodo, who was defeated by Google's DeepMind AlphaGo algorithm in 2016, which was earth-shattering because it was never thought possible. This technology uses reinforcement learning. Robotics has been made easier to train using reinforcement learning as well. We all know or have probably seen this famous robot, Spot, made by Boston Dynamics, which has been used in a vast array of industries, from retail to dangerous conditions, such as in mining or radioactive situations. I was fortunate enough to actually play around with this robot a few weeks ago. And when you actually see it, the dexterity and speed with which it moves is surreal. It's like you're in a sci-fi movie. This technology is trained using reinforcement learning. Lastly, of course, the conversation is incomplete without looking at generative AI. For example, the large language models we were talking about earlier. What is it that has led to the explosion in this technology? Right? If you think about it, we've had chatbots for a long time. Natural language processing has been around for a long time. We've had autocomplete on our phones. What's happened in the last year? There's two equations to that. The first one is the transformer technology, but that's one half of the story. The second part is the application of reinforcement learning, which has led to the language models being able to speak like humans. There's an entire reinforcement learning fr framework that is wrapped around the language models. There's so many other examples. So the examples I've shown you have a common thread in the explosion of these critical technologies in massive ways. That is deep reinforcement learning. It would be a pity if we don't leverage off that to improve our asset liability modeling space. And as actually we started using machine learning in, in a few spaces, but this is where true AI lies. This is the big step to the general intelligence, you know, that we, we're actually seeking. So let's have a deeper dive now into the building blocks. How do we actually set it up? This is something we had to do when we created this. And this is not just piggybacking off, you know, existing technology. We're building it internally from the ground up with domain-specific knowledge. And the first ingredient, if you think of this as a dish, there's two main ingredients. The first is the reinforcement learning part. And what it, what it does is that it allows AI to carry out trial and error, to experiment. And when you find something that works, it exploits it. It also allows it to learn from the past. So it's a very critical part. Just, just to take a step back, one can think of machine learning as falling into three main categories. The first one is supervised learning. So this is when you have structured data and you have clear labels for which your machine learning should optimize for. So a GLM is an example of a supervised learning. A gradient boosting machine is an example. The second category is when you have unlabeled data. You just want to find patterns and group that data. So that's unsupervised learning. The third type is the one we're talking about. That's reinforcement learning. This is a type of machine learning where you just tell the AI the ultimate objective of what, you, what you're trying to do. You don't tell it how. And it's a more general form of intelligence. And it usually creates um, the need to create a bot or an agent. 
That is the ability to sense around its environment. As intelligent beings, we have the ability to move and make decisions within our environment because we can see, we can smell, right? We can feel. So this is the same attributes that we give to this agent so that it can work within this environment. In order to do that, we unfortunately need a more complex type of programming called object-oriented programming or class programming, which is a bit more complex compared to a standard functional programming that you see in R or Python. But you can implement this in Python. Once you've set it up, and this is perhaps the biggest learning curve for actuaries, you know, because it requires a higher command of computer science. But it's not impossible. Once you've set it up, we train this agent by rewarding it for good behavior and punishing it for bad behavior, and we optimize it for long-term objectives, often at the sacrifice of short-term goals. Within the object-oriented programming, there are five main components that we need to define. The first is the agent itself. That's the decision-making entity. In our case, that is the asset liability management agent. The second is the environment within which this agent works. So we need to define that clearly. In our situation, it could be the company, your institution, or the markets. We also need to clearly define the actions which the agent can take. In our situation, we want to find the optimal asset allocation at any given time, at, at any given point in time. So the agent needs to assign weights to each and every asset that is available in our universe at every given time point. We also need to define the states. The states are the sensory inputs in your environment that the agent senses from the environment. In our situation of asset liability management, this includes the duration values of the liabilities and the assets, but also the, the, the values themselves of the, of the liabilities and the duration and their histories. The most important component of all of these is the reward function. Remember, this framework optimizes for a reward in the long term. So you need to be very careful when you define, and very specific when you define this objective. And in our situation of asset liability management, we want to minimize the duration difference between the asset portfolio and the liability portfolio. So somehow we need to tell it that objective. And we have a mathematical representation there where you have a simplified scenario of two assets of that reward function. Once you set up your, your components in your framework, you, you're almost 80% there. And this diagram on the bottom right illustrates how these components will interact. On the bottom, you have the agent. You have defined it. And now it takes actions within the environment. And it gets two forms of feedback from the environment. The first is the reward, positive or negative? Was that good or bad? The second is an updated state or set of states. Remember, we're in a situation where the environment is constantly changing, right? This is dynamic. So the agent needs to constantly know, what is my state? What is my new state? Sometimes the agent's actions actually affect the state, right? And when it, you do this multiple times, the agent starts to figure out what are the best actions that maximize rewards in a given state? If you think about it, this is how we as human beings learn, right? We have this continuous loop through time. Sensory inputs, even our own decisions, um, you, know, you know, end up with some results, right? And this is how we learn as kids growing up within this framework. Other animals also use this framework. The second ingredient of this dish is deep learning. We have all heard of deep learning at some point. The gist of this, without going into too much detail, is that it provides perception and processing of a lot of data. That's the entire sort of main power of deep learning within this framework. From a technical perspective, it's really an assemblement of many classifiers in an array to create this capability, right? or multiple neurons. A neuron is just a node where there's a transformation from a weight and an input to give an output. And it almost mimics the brain. 
right? You've seen many of these, they are large. And they have the ability to perceive complex patterns by taking a set of inputs and processing them and crunching um, through these multiple neurons and optimizing them for the weights, and you have outputs. In our situation of asset liability management, time is an important index here. Assets values move through time, liability values move through time, as claims are processed, as new risks are covered, that, that environment is so constantly changing. The markets are constantly changing. Yield curves are changing, inflation rates are changing, just to name a few. So we need special forms of deep learning in the form of recurrent neural networks, which can keep track of changes through time and signals through time and relationships through time. And there are even more specialized forms of of these, which are called long, short, term memory networks, and this is what we applied here. We have a visual representation there, just to show the indexing through time, and there is a zoom in on the, on the bottom right of this LSTM, which is very powerful. In fact, for those interested, this LSTM was one of the sort of predecessors of transformers, you know, these, these, these structures. So they're very, very powerful, and they're interlinked. So we mentioned the reinforcement learning part, and we boost it with the deep learning, and then we end up with our deep reinforcement learning architecture. And this diagram is similar to what we saw before, except that we have that deep learning model embedded in the decision-making part of the, of the framework. So our agent now is equipped with this big brain now. You know, it's no longer just a simple agent. And if you think about it, this is a big differentiator of us as humans to other animals. Other animals learn as well, but what is it that makes us different as humans? We have a very large brain relative to our body mass. We can process, in addition to a physical input, language, writing, drawing, and so forth. So we now have created this true form of intelligence, and we're going to deploy it to our ALM now. It has the power to experiment and exploit, as mentioned before, a depth of perception, long-term strategic ability, and is perfect for environments with complexity through time, with vast arrays of, of options. If you think about it, there's literally infinite possible ways to al allocate your assets, right? And there's infinite ways for the market to, to, to change every day, literally. And there's complex relationship between actions and, and outcomes. So this is perfect for this. We added the TensorFlow library to execute the deep learning, which is a powerful, scalable, open source library, one of the, the, the most um, efficient ones. And that's also a big learning curve when it comes to this space. And we combined it within our OOP. How do you then train this AI? Where do you get real data from? And that's a significant question, right? And the answer is actually simple. You don't need real data. That's one of the advantages of these frameworks. You can simulate data based on the environment that you created. In fact, this is how they train those gaming AIs and even autonomous driving. They don't, try by, they don't start by trying to give it real data. They simulate the environment. It's almost like giving it a push start, and then you deploy it because it's got that power to continuously learn. So this is what we did here. We simulated 10,000 scenarios of outcomes, and we showed it to the AI, and from there it learned, and later on we deployed it in, 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 in the test data. We are visually showing the scenarios here, a subset of them, and each line there represents one path of evolution, or one scenario of changes in duration through time. So you can see some are increasing, some are decreasing. There's different stochasticity in there, and there's different you know, variability in how they evolve over time. And if we zoom into one of them, we'll be able to see in the next slide what it looks like. And before we go there, there's just a, uh, an illustrative formula there for how we generated these simulations. So in the paper, you'll be able to actually understand more how we actually did that,
but there's some trend element and some stochastic element to generate this data. And zooming into one of them, we have a scenario here for illustration where we have an increasing duration over time. This might correspond to a life insurance company where the average age of the policy holders is reducing over time, and the time to claim is increasing over time, right? And we also simulate a short bond and a long bond. We have a simplified scenario with two assets, zero coupon bonds, and the short bond is represented in blue, and the long bond is represented in, in gray. So what we, we would expect the AI to do here is to allocate more towards the long bond because the duration is increasing and less towards the short bond, right? This is one of the things we're gonna test. And we have an example of the opposite scenario there, and we have an algorithm for how we simulated the terms of the zero coupon bonds there. The training can be computationally intensive because there's multiple scenarios to go through. However, once you train it, it's very quick to actually deploy in reality. And here we can see that we had to go through 100 cycles of the entire data set to actually get that reward function to a level which we're comfortable with. And this can take several hours on a normal PC, but it can be scalable, of course, if you have you know, like bigger resources. So once we trained our AI to simplify it, we put it through four rigorous tests on unseen test data. You know, that's new data it wasn't trained on. And we wanted to see how it performs versus our traditional way of doing things. The first test was to see at the baseline, how does it compare to our vanilla approach, the Reddington immunization approach? We looked at a scenario where we have a five-year time period, hence the time um, with 60 time points there. And for this specific scenario, we have reducing duration over time. And in black, in the dotted black, we see the results of the Reddington immunization and in orange with the results of the, the, the reinforcement learning. As we can clearly see, it tracks quite closely. That's quite interesting. However, the phenomenal thing is that it could perform or replicate similar results, but with no need for theoretical assumptions. Remember, in the Reddington approach, we have that whole list of assumptions that you need to do. Furthermore, at each time point in the Reddington approach, we had to recalculate the, the appropriate weighting at every time point. Whereas in the AI approach, you just train the AI and it automatically updates itself. It looks at the trends in the data, it looks at seasonality, it looks at variability, and it understands the ultimate objective. So this is phenomenal. And here, just to confirm, it did allocate more towards the short bond versus the long bond, as expected. What we saw before was just one example. We wanted to make sure that our results are statistically significant, right? So we looked at a comparison of the differences at given time points. So after one year, two years, four years, and five years. And we plotted the distributions of those deviations. And we also added nine confidence intervals of the percentages of those deviations. And what we actually saw, and these are, sh these are shown in the dotted blue black lines there. What we actually saw is that when you consider the 95% deviation levels, the results are indeed statistically similar. That was the first test. So just to see, you know, can it do as well as we have? And it can. Can we do one better though? What if we train this agent in one environment and throw it in a different environment? How does it perform? We know that the traditional way of doing things only work for small changes in interest rates. And if the environment changes, you know, you have to, you, you, have, no, you have no alternative. How does the AI perform? So we looked at a different set of test data, which was significantly different in terms of its volatility compared to the data that we trained the AI on. 
an example is shown here. It's not clear in terms of trend, you know, what this, this, this scenario looks like. Sharp drop, sharp increase, and indeterminate bouncing around there. So we had thousands and thousands of these scenarios. What was remarkable was, was that it was able to hold its own. In fact, it was able to thrive and still maintain acceptable levels of optimization within the, the duration outcomes. 95% of the results were within 2% of our, our desired outcome durations. It's not as great as the 1% before, but given that this is an entirely different environment, it's quite astounding. This is something that is very difficult to achieve within the traditional way of doing things. The third test was to say, okay, what if there's an existing strategy within a real company, how does this AI compare in terms of its risk management outcomes? We mentioned earlier that in reality, you know, most organizations you know, face you know, time-consuming issues, you know, the process is highly manual, and it's resource intensive. So in reality, most organizations can probably fully balance maybe a couple of times a month. So we assumed as a benchmark strategy, just for our comparison, an organization which can balance, rebalance the ALM on a weekly basis as a benchmark strategy. If we look at this example, that's represented in blue. So at every turn there, there's a rebalancing that's happening. Where we should be, from a theoretical perspective, is represented in gray. So you can see that at rebalancing time points, as expected, the allocation is exactly the same as the theoretical one, right? The issue comes in between. There are gaps there, which represents exposure to the company. In contrast, the reinforcement learning, because of its speed and automation and ability to carry out high-frequency ALM, it's able to track quite closely to the theoretical level. And in our comparison, we first looked at the deviation at the end of that 30-day period between the AI and the theoretical level, and the results are close and normally distributed as, as before. On the other hand, when you look at the benchmark strategies outcomes, you see these thick tails, which represent large deviations at a randomly chosen time point. When you do further analysis and convert this into sensitivity of portfolios, we saw that the deep reinforcement learning asset allocation um, portfolios were three times less sensitive to interest rate changes compared to our benchmark strategy. That is 67% reduction in sensitivity, which is outstanding and is a game changer for this space. The last series of tests was with respect to multiple objective optimization. We know that the current methods don't provide a clear way, an explicit way, an internal way to manage many objectives at the same time. But the AI can do this, and we showed a test here. So we asked it to, on top of its normal duration matching task, we asked it to, where possible, create a buffer between our asset duration and our liability duration. Why might you want to do that? There might be tactical opportunities in the market where you can actually increase your returns. However, more importantly, you might want an extra buffer of security. For example, in this current climate, it's better to have your asset duration significantly lower than your liability duration when interest rates are increasing. So this is why you might want to modify your objective from a, mathemat from, a math math sorry, from a mathematical perspective, we had to create an updated objective function, so a composite objective function, in order to reflect these multiple objectives. So there's a bit more work that's needed here as well. The objective function or the reward function is always a critical element in, in reinforcement learning. Once we did that and we analyzed the results, it was astounding. So what we did is we plotted the duration 
for the liabilities, less the duration for the asset portfolio, and we got this twin peaked graph here. And what this showed is that the first peak corresponds to outcomes for the first objective, the second peak corresponds to outcomes for the second objective, which was actually the majority. So it was able to juggle between two objectives at the same time. And you can even expand this to many other objective functions. So this is a game changer within our space because you can do this consistently. You can take away the need for human input in, in order to adjust for it, and it speeds up the process. In summary, we started our journey by having a look at the traditional approaches in asset liability management. And we saw that there are large gaps that we haven't been able to fill up until now. And those large gaps can be filled by AI through deep reinforcement learning. Some of our key results showed that it can perform as well as a traditional approach with no requirement for theoretical assumptions. We also saw that it is robust when market conditions change and also that it's able to understand the higher order objectives of what we're trying to do here. And it also shows that it doesn't overfit to a given training data set, right? And it's able to adapt. From a practical implementation perspective, we can expect to see a significant improvement in risk management outcomes. Also, we have this unparalleled ability to carry out multiple objective optimization through this approach. There are also a host of other advantages. It's able to carry out ALM in an automated fashion with little or no supervision at all. It doesn't need to take sick leave. It doesn't need to take study leave. It's constantly monitoring the market. It doesn't get tired, right? So that's a key, key advantage. And for us actuaries, it's able to internally incorporate the actuarial control cycle which is critical to our work. Remember there's that feedback loop of actions to monitoring to results constantly. It's built in the solution inherently. In our current way of doing things, you take an action here a year later, no one knows what ended up happening because of what decisions. It's just too complex, but this is inbuilt. There's an ability to also process big data, voluminous data, high moving data with accuracy, and also, as organizations modernize, they're starting to improve their systems. And there's a benefit from an interoperability perspective because this is written in Python, newer technology platforms, and you can integrate it within your business systems. Earlier, we heard of APIs. You can think of a situation where you have an API linking to your liability data, linking to your asset data, you know, to your Bloomberg terminals, linking to your market data and it's all centralized within this one decision-making agent. So it's gonna cut out a lot of the manual pain points within our work, and it's scalable. These days, everything is going to the cloud. You know, this um, technology is written on you know, TensorFlow, for example, which runs on GPUs. You can easily scale it on web and cloud providers such as AWS, Azure, and so forth. So there are vast advantages here. We also saw that it doesn't need theoretical assumptions. It understands the ultimate objective, right? And there's a reduction in the need for human beings in this process. We're not saying we're cutting out ourselves as actuaries here. What we're saying is that we're delegating the repetitive, the mundane elements of ALM to the AI, and we can focus on the bigger picture, the strategic elements of our work, the more fun parts of our job. The vision here is to create a symbiotic relationship where our productivity is increased. This was just a first step in us developing and taking ownership of this technology with our own domain-specific knowledge. There is so much more we can do in this space. To begin with, we need to see the practical challenges in implementing this you know, and how we circumvent those. We can also think of complex objectives and combinations of objectives. For example, there might be complex regulatory constraints that we need to get around, so that's worth investigating. The power of this is that you can also incorporate non-numeric data. For example, market sentiment. You can think of it 
pinging, you know, the news, you know, before the market moves. You might even start to see relationships between certain announcements and, and certain results, right? That's a power, you know. This kind of also touches on large language models as well, but I'll actually get into that in a sec. And you can also extend this technology into what's called reinforcement learning with human inputs. This is what has contributed to the explosion of large language models. You can, you know, remember the first version of ChatGPT was very poor, but version four now, there's a dramatic improvement. This is because of the feedback, the constant feedback from human beings. And it's able to learn quicker. It's also able to have better results that are suitable for our, for our use cases. So this is when you allow the learning process to be nudged by a human being, right? And also for incorporation of context that the AI doesn't have initially. And also, there is so much potential for reinforcement learning in other actuarial areas. We also need to have a, a deeper thought about how we see our roles as actuaries. We will need to think about how to oversee this technology when we implement it. Also, some control measures as well. We're not going to let it roam free. And also, how we upskill as actuaries, because this requires a bit more training, right? And how we see our roles going forward, especially when we work with an AI. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire world is engulfed in this AI revolution. The spirit of Frank Reddington there calls on us to join this revolution, to join the trenches of that revolution by working on this technology. It is better to actually disrupt ourselves internally than to, be, than to wait to be disrupted externally. As Abraham Lincoln once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And to do that, we need to be comfortable and to embrace borrowing different hats from different industries so that we can learn and bring back and build our profession. And for that, we must forever remember that the actuary who's only an actuary is not an actuary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Takura. And let me just start with a comment in on the, uh, on the chat from Tara saying what an excellent paper and amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, we'd love to open to the floor for questions. Uh, we have a roving microphone, so just raise a hand if you'd like to engage the speaker. Um, and uh, we're very, very happy. We've got about nine minutes in hand, so we can accommodate a couple of questions. Um, in the meantime, yep. should we start with one on, on the app there? From yeah, well, I, th I think we can do that. Thank you, uh, Piper. Fantastic presentation, Takura. Okay. Uh, this is the time where I tell people that I actually once mentored you <laughs> <laughs> to take all that glory, but I'll not do that. Um, <laughs> so the question is, it would be interesting to see what would occur if the reward was defined as something along the lines of minimize the possibility of us not being able to meet our liabilities and to see how that asset allocation would compare to when the reward is linked to duration. So the bot may find a better way of us achieving the main goal without using duration? That's a question, essentially. Yeah, that's a great question. So for those who didn't get that, I think the question is about formulating the reward function in a different way, right? Yeah, that's right. Almost in a higher general order sense, in a general right. sense. And that is a fair point, and it's a good point. When I was doing this work over the past two years, I think 50% of the time was spent on formulating the reward function. It's the most important part. And there isn't one way to do it. So my answer there is yes, it is a good idea. Mm. However, you need to give the AI tangible objectives, right? Mm. If you think about computers, you know, they at their heart work with ones and zeros, mm. right? So you kind of need to be somewhere in the middle, you know. So the way we have it now is kind of somewhere in the middle between the zeros and ones and, you know, what the question is about. And as the technology improves more and more, we can perhaps see a scenario where we can actually 
have such a you know, general sense. And it is linked to the, you know, the states, right? The sensory input. Yeah. So you need to actually be more specific in saying, okay, how do you convert your sensory inputs to decisions? That is a challenge. However, yeah, it would make our lives much easier. It's just not possible at this, at this time point. Awesome. We do have a question that we can take in the audience. I don't know if, okay, there's a microphone already with one. We will have another question on the other side. We can start this side. Cool. No, th thanks, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I was just curious to, to maybe understand the output part of, you know, what is being modeled, right? So, because generally the output is your SAA, right? Your strategic asset allocation. So, we have the, um, I would assume it's the performance of the assets versus the performance of the liabilities. It will be interesting to see how your assets, the portfolio changes over time. Um, I think maybe this speaks to the first limitation that you talked to around practical implication, because you might find that you're matching your liabilities over time, but the underlying portfolio is changing violently. Right, which you know yeah. brings other real-world implications as well, yeah. because typically you do these for clients, maybe every five years or so. Mm -hmm. You'll have a SAA; it remains fixed, mm -hmm. um, and it's not dynamically mm -hmm. being rebalanced, as you're saying here. Mm -hmm. So those are the real-world implications. Because what is being presented is probably fine from the back end, your modeling point of view, mm -hmm. but the real world implications may be, yeah, may need a bit of work there. Thanks. That's a great comment. I assume based on your question that you're an expert or professional working in investments, right? Yeah. So the first point is that I'm not an expert within you know, the investment space. However, someone had to start this work and this also, to be fair, is a multidisciplinary space, right? I have an overall understanding. There are nuances like the ones you're talking about. You know, you know, governance, strategic asset allocation, tactical asset allocation, all those phrases for the guys' investments, right? And yes, you don't want to be bouncing your, you know, your portfolio allocation from day to day. It's got other problems such as, you know, transaction costs and so forth, right? Um, and impact of liquidity movement and whatever, whatever, whatever. All that uh, implication. So this work was really just a proof of concept, right? And you can reflect those additional considerations through your reward function. So my reward function was very simple. Proof of concept, right? And you can then add those additional con considerations. For example, you could add a cost component to there, right? To say, listen, um, you know, make sure your transaction costs are max X percent of the portfolio. And you can even explicitly add maybe the, the investment committee's you know, constraints in there as well. You know? Maybe they might have maximum movements in allocation that are allowed per asset. You can build all of that in the reward function, right? So the question is indeed a fair point and it actually needs to be actually addressed when you're deploying that in, in, in reality, right? And even before we maybe are able to fully, I don't know, I don't know, have a, a comprehensive reward function, we could have an oversight mechanism, right? We could still run our normal ALM and then we can run this on the side and you know, there's a decision maker in the end who's seeing, okay, what are the recommendations from the AI? And then you can take it to the investment committee or the board and discuss to say, guys, there's some movement in the market, our AI algorithm is picking up X, A, sorry, A, B, C, should we do X, Y, Z, for example, you know? So it could be used initially in that fashion, but great points and definitely worth considering. Over to the left. I wanted to just find out also in the uh, model where you had uh, multiple uh, or at least two objectives. Um, 
Did you also look at the outcomes? So in other words, you know, where sometimes it was duration neutral, sometimes maybe one year apart, uh, and you get that distribution with, with sort of two pillars. Uh, but did you see the evidence of the outcome uh, still giving the, you know, especially in those cases where the duration was perhaps up to one year higher or lower on the liabilities versus assets, whether the outcomes of, let's say, a bigger surplus or a more, more excess of assets over liabilities. Did you consider that yet? Or is that something that you'd have to build into your reward function, perhaps? Or did you test, test the, valid the validity of, of, of that distribution and whether it did give the optimized um, outcomes? Yeah, great question as well. We didn't go much deeper than what we should, but that would be an avenue for additional work, of course. Um, we just wanted to see if it's possible to actually do it, you know, in a multiple optimization fashion. So, so no, but yes, we should definitely look into that. And there's scope to actually, you know, improve the reward function, yeah. So, oh, there's another question. So no one is worried about AI taking over our jobs. I would have expected that question. Um. <laughs> uh, thanks, Takura. Um, great presentation, eh? Um, so just in terms of, um, so I know in this particular piece of work you looked at zero coupon bonds, but if you, I mean, to what extent do you think it would um, improve the ability of the AI if you were to say include instead of two assets, maybe three, four, or five, um, possibly ones with perhaps a little bit more complex cash flow structures, do you think that would assist it in even doing a better job? Yes, indeed. So we use the two asset example for illustration, but the AI thrives in situations where there's multiple assets, right? That's the power of the deep learning component, it's able to keep track of different types of assets. You know, you could have bonds in there, which will probably be the majority, and equities and even derivatives as well. It's able to keep track of all of those. And if you want, you can even go one step further and even build in sort of embedded models for when you expect cash flows for each of those assets. You know, so you would have basically an expansion, sorry, an expansion of your states, right, into an array of states. It could be millions and millions of, of data points. And you could even embed models there as well. So definitely that's one of the potential benefits of this framework. And yeah, this is also, yeah, very, very um, encouraging in terms of its ability to do that. Takura, thank you so much. Uh, can I loop back to at the start for those who want to do further reading? You mentioned publication yeah. in a journal. Just remind us which journal that is. It's called Intelligent Systems with Applications. So it's recently been accepted there. And it's currently in production. So within a few weeks, it, it will be live there. Perfect. So you can just search on Google. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. That was a fantastic thank presentation, Takura. Well done. Right, at this point, we're going to take a short refreshment break. Uh, a number of our sponsors have got fantastic coffee on offer. Please do go and take advantage of that. If you haven't checked out the chess tournament, I believe they're down to the semi-final phases, so go and swing by the exhibition hall for that as well. And if you want to focus and center yourself back in the present, uh, there is a Liberty Mindfulness session kicking off as well. Enjoy all of that, everybody. Enjoy the break.